Ideas matter. The 20th century witnessed the most destructive war in all of human history. War about ideas. Western democracy won that war. It also witnessed a half-century-long Cold War, and Western democracy won that war. Despite the hardships and destruction of these conflicts, human beings made more progress in the 20th century than in all previous centuries on Earth. And this progress was led by remarkable advances in science, technology, free markets, and democratic political ideas. This progress could be measured by population numbers, life expectancy, health, education, pollution abatement, living standards, and political, economic, and personal freedom. Well, the devastating and despicable terrorist attack on New York City and Washington, D.C. on September 11th of 2001 is not a promising beginning for the 21st century. This attack was carried out by a small group who combined hatred of the values of Western democracies with a religious fanaticism probably unmatched in modern times. Some of the most important of the Western values they attacked are the very ones that have led to the extraordinary progress of the 20th century. Namely, science, technology, free markets, and democracy. Well, despite this beginning, many knowledgeable people around the world think the 21st century will yet surpass the 20th in human progress and by a large measure. For yes, ideas do matter. And this program is meant to help you sort out the risks and the benefits of certain ideas in science, technology, and a free society for your life in the 21st century. Here are five of the most important global issues today. Population. Are there too many people in the world? Resources. Are we running out of energy, forest, soil, and other natural resources? Three, pollution. How serious are our toxic waste and pollution problems, including global warming? Biotechnology. How will genetic engineering and other advances in biology change lives in the 21st century? And finally, lifestyles. Do we need to change from a growth to a new no-growth green lifestyle in the 21st century? For help in answering these questions, we interviewed some prominent experts. Question number one, population. Are there too many people in the world? Well, for help in answering this question, we talk first to Reed Bryson, an internationally respected climate scientist, and for 15 years, the director of the Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We asked Dr. Bryson, what was the number one environmental problem in the world today? The world is already saturated with people. That is clearly the number one problem. In fact, if there were not as many people, there wouldn't be as much carbon dioxide put in the atmosphere, right? There wouldn't be as much oil and coal used. There would be plenty of farmland to produce food for everybody. Let's take the example of India because everybody knows that India has had frequent periods of want of food. And I have a lot of experience in India. Could the work of India be done with half as many people? Yes, because they're essentially half unemployed. So with half as many people, the land would still produce the same amount of food. They'd have twice as much food per person and twice as much wealth per person. Biologist Paul Ehrlich, in a best-selling book of 30 years ago, predicted that because of overpopulation, countries like India could never hope to feed their population. He also predicted that over 65 million Americans would die of famine in the 1980s. Fortunately, neither of these predictions came true. Well, the world today does have over 6 billion people. Assuming for the moment that is too many, how many fewer people would be better? Well, Howard Odom, 
one of the founders of modern ecology and presently professor at the University of Florida, thinks that a growing shortage of fossil fuels and other natural resources will cause a major reduction in the world's population in the near future, no matter what we might want to happen. Not drastic, uh, but um, certainly down to a billion, if you want to keep a good standard of living. And you don't have to do it fast. You've got a couple of generations to do it. Well, until recently, this view that the world is vastly overpopulated already, and indeed that overpopulation is itself one of the major, if not the major, cause of social disasters, was probably the majority view among scientists and among educated people. In recent years, however, it has been sharply and successfully challenged by many scientists. One of the most persuasive and influential of the challengers was the late economist from the University of Maryland, Julian Simon. I'm sure not for overpopulation, but when they say overpopulation, they just mean more people on Earth. Strangest thing when you think about it. For all of human history, we have been trying to and conquer death so that we could live long lives without worrying about our children dying young. 10,000 years ago, we only had the capacity to keep alive one million people on the face of the earth. Even 150 years ago, we could only support a billion people. Now we can support five billion people living longer and healthier than ever before. It would seem to me that anybody who cares about human life would jump up and down and say, isn't this a wonderful triumph? It's the greatest triumph in all of human history. Instead, they turn around somehow and say, look at this terrible thing that's happening to us. But wait, we asked Dr. Simon, biologists point out that in a pond, for instance, frogs will multiply and multiply until finally they run out of food and space and they'll go into cannibalism. Isn't that the way it is with human beings? You've got it exactly right, Bill, when you say many biologists, because the biologists have been the strongest of the doomsaying voices. To some extent, I think this reflects biological thinking. It's true that if you have a given pond and you increase the number of lilies, eventually the process has got to stop. But perhaps because of the nature of their training and of the work they do, the biologists don't see the human part of this. The pond will only support so many of us, so we've got to do something about it. And we do. Here is how it works with both population as well as with resources, claims Dr. Simon. The number will grow, or we get richer, or both. And that puts pressure on resources. When that happens, the price of resources begins to go up. That is, there's increasing scarcity. Well, the increasing scarcity is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for people who want to uh, make a profit. It's an opportunity for people who want to make a contribution to knowledge and to society by resolving problems. So people tackle the, the problem. Some people fail, but they pay the price themselves. Some people succeed and find solutions to the problems. Here's the extraordinary part. The solutions that they find to the problems leave us better off than if the problems had never arisen in the first place. That's why each human generation tends to leave the world and society a slightly richer place than the generation who came before. That's the extraordinary, extraordinary phenomenon and that's the process that the biologists don't see. We asked Julian Simon if his was a lone voice or if others shared his views about population. With respect to population growth, 10 years ago, I was a very small minority, that's true. But in the past 10 years, the entire scientific world has changed. In 1986, we had a report of the National Academy of Sciences called Population Growth and Economic Development. And this study turned about 160 degrees, almost completely around, from the 1971 National Academy of Sciences report 
which was terribly worried about population growth and insisted that slowing population growth was the best way to increase economic development. This report says something like population growth is at most a minor negative effect. In some places it may be negative, in some places it may be positive, and it's an extraordinarily unworried report coming almost all the way to my position. So no, I'm not giving you a um, minority view about anything, not even now about population growth, among those people whose business it is to study these matters. Okay, we move on now to our second of our major questions, one closely connected with the population question and with other issues to come, like global warming. Are we running out of energy and natural resources? Environmentalist Jeremy Rifkin, president of the Foundation for Economic Trends, gives one widely held view today. U.S. population is also the main users of resources on the planet. Uh, Six percent of the population on this globe lives in our country. Yet we're using a third of the resources of this earth. And we are responsible for about 28 percent of global warming. Every statistical survey I see says that we're going to be running out of fossil fuel. Deforestation. It's become uncontrollable, way beyond our projections just five years ago. We have to learn that the more we consume, the less resources are available on the earth for other human beings and other creatures. This is widely held. Some people may be surprised to know that the majority of working scientists do not share this opinion. To get this view of working scientists, we talked to Marion Clausen. Now, Dr. Clausen was the head of the Bureau of Land Management in the Department of the Interior and has spent his life studying and administering our nation's natural resources. He recently retired from his work as a forestry researcher with the Foundation Resources for the Future. We ask him his views about forests and other natural resources. Widespread belief that we are destroying and depleting our forests. Not so, not so, quite the contrary. We've been building them back and, and now again, I, no one should deny that there are situations which might be considered regrettable, uh, uh, but, but taken as a whole, the situation for American forests is very good. Well, what about things like farmland, food, and other natural resources? Well, certainly there are, is an enormous amount of popular interest and in, stimulated by the media uh, in, in the gloom and doom thing. When you go back to Malthus and even go back earlier than that, gonna just population is growing, how are we going to feed them and so on. Yet the fact is we've, uh, food supply has increased as fast as population has increased. We've more often had surpluses than not. And so on. But I don't think the answer lies in us cutting, well, I think we could cut back on waste, I think, and, and I think there are more efficient ways of using resources, but the, the probability is that the rest of the world is going to move up. As today, half the world is poor and half is rich. 300 years ago, all the world was poor. 300 years from now, all the world could be rich by today's standards, and I think that's the answer. We've always been here at Resources for the Future, and I personally what we call cautious optimists. Sure, there are problems. There are always problems. This is what challenges you. Uh, but we think that, that we can solve the problems. We think the, the, uh, the picture as a whole is favorable and, and, and good. Uh, we think that, uh, contrary to many of the conservation, we think life today is a lot richer and better than it was a generation ago. When it comes to energy resources, his cautious optimism was shared by environmentalist Amory Lovins, director of the Rocky Mountain Institute and a worldwide expert on energy. I've, I work in about 20-odd oh, countries, and uh, I'm perpetually amazed by the, the power of five billion minds wrapping around a problem. Uh, I think the more we talk to each other around the world, the less reason we'll have to feel guilty at our waste and the more reason we'll have to feel good about the lessons we're exchanging in how to live more lightly and enable many other people in the world to live as good a life as we do. I asked Mr. Lovins in his field of energy expertise, 
Could the rest of the world hope to equal the United States in standard of living? In energy, unquestionably. Uh, in fact, in an analysis for the German government around 1980, some colleagues and I assumed for the sake of argument a world of 8 billion people, all with a West German standard of living, complete heavy industrialization of the world. Now, for many reasons, this is probably not possible or desirable, but energy is not one of them, because we found that by using energy cost-effectively with 1980 prices, 1980 technologies, we could end up using a little more than a third as much total energy as now uh, and getting it all from cost-effective renewables. Well, Julian Simon's special field of expertise is natural resources as they are related to population. I ask him about the majority views of scientists regarding resource problems. When I say to you, that our food situation gets better and better decade after decade and the future looks similarly optimistic. I'm giving you the mainstream view of agricultural economists. And here it's not just mainstream, it's like 98% of them. Not the 2% who are quoted in the papers all the time, curiously enough. I learned these ideas from them. They're not original with me. With respect to are we running out of minerals and raw materials, or will the future hold more availability? Here I give you a view which may not be 98%, but is the consensus of resource economists. But what about fossil fuels? Ecologists like Howard Odom point out that almost all of our industrial wealth is built on using fossil fuels. And we are going to run out of them in a few generations. Won't we then have to cut back drastically on population and living standards? Simply working on an economic theory created by an economist, Thomas Malthus, that is wholly discredited by the facts. He's working solely on the basis of this abstract proposition that there's a fixed amount of stuff, use some, there'll be less to go around. And this is utterly contradicted by the, all the scientific facts that show it goes just the other way. That raw materials, including energy, have been becoming more available and less scarce, not more scarce, less scarce, all throughout human history. I hear it's peculiar. These people call themselves scientists. But if science means anything, it means testing your ideas against the observed data. And if your theories don't fit the facts, you change your theories. And yet, they continue to maintain the same theory, despite the fact that it has been discredited by all the available facts. And when you say to them, why do you maintain this theory, despite all the facts of history? They then say, but all the facts of history are not relevant, because things have to be different in the future. Now that's not a scientific point of view, that's a metaphysical point of view. It should be noted that Julian Simon's views are strongly opposed by some, though by no means all, of the scientists involved in environmental movements. But here is how Thomas Lovejoy of the Smithsonian Institute reacted to Simon's ideas and criticisms. Well, these, these numbers are not precise numbers, they're estimates. But criticisms from somebody like Julian Simon are utterly trivial. I mean, the man does not understand biology at all and doesn't want to. Julian Simon is the guy who says you can do it with mirrors. As I'm sure you're beginning to notice, one problem in science and society measures right up against another one, and how you answer one has a lot to do with how you answer another. As I'm also sure you are noticing, values and emotions play as big a part as facts and theories. The third of our big questions, how serious are our toxic waste and pollution problems today? especially the problem called global warming. To get the majority view on global warming, we talked again to Amory Lovins. We're off a lot of fossil fuel in the world, but we're starting to realize that we can't burn it all, especially we can't burn the bulk of it, which is the coal, for very long without getting in trouble by changing the Earth's climate. Because whenever you burn that carbon that's been locked up in the ground for a long time, it becomes carbon dioxide in the air, it absorbs heat, and you get global warming. If you don't like it, you can, in a while, probably row up to the capital steps in your rowboat and complain about it. 
Now to prevent global warming from excessive carbon dioxide in the air, Mr. Lovins, as well as prominent politicians like presidential candidate Al Gore, propose that we cut back drastically on our use of fossil fuels. They also promote increased research and reliance on new renewable energy technologies, dramatic increases in efficiency, and new ways to take carbon dioxide out of the air. Here it needs to be emphasized that although too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere may lead to a warmer Earth, carbon dioxide itself is not a chemical harmful to life. On the contrary, plants, animals, and human beings are all built using carbon dioxide as one of the critical building materials. The green leaves of plants take carbon dioxide out of the air when they make living tissues, and hence all of our food, in the process known as photosynthesis. In a living cycle then, all living things, plants, animals, and humans, breathe out carbon dioxide every moment of our lives. Green plants, especially forests, do take out more carbon dioxide than they add, so planting trees is good and cutting down trees is bad for possible global warming. Thomas Lovejoy explains. Tropical forests hold an enormous pool of carbon, so as they're cut and they're burned, they're adding to the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere and the problems of the increased greenhouse effect. Despite the majority opinion here of scientists on global warming and the recent controversies about the International Kyoto Treaty, there are a significant number of climate experts who disagree. Richard Lindzen, for instance, one of the world's most respected climatologists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, explains his dissenting view. Certain gases have been increasing. The question has been, uh, can we readily expect these to lead to significant warming? The evidence of the past, which is to say the last hundred years, when we've already increased greenhouse substances, or I should better say minor greenhouse substances. Certainly the, the most important is water vapor. The next most important is water in cloud form. The gases like carbon dioxide and methane are, are distant, distant, distant thirds and fourths. And uh, they have increased significantly over the last century. I would argue that what we have seen so far tells us our models are wrong and are greatly overestimating what CO2 will do in the future. If you ask that the models be consistent with what we have seen so far, it's saying by the end of the next century, we will see less than a degree warming. Well, global warming is only one of the science and society issues that arise from unwanted pollutants in our air, water, and soil. What about other toxic wastes? To get some help here, we talked to Bruce Ames, biochemist at the University of California, Berkeley, and an internationally respected expert in toxic waste problems. What all, whatever I've been learning is telling me that pollution really is pretty much irrelevant to public health. It might be a little problem here and there, but it's not a, a very important problem. And the whole country seems to be thinking that pollution is very important. Well, yes, indeed, many people do think pollution is very important. We're surprised. Is this view of yours that pollution in America is not very important today an unusual one for people like yourself? That is, for working scientists, toxicologists who specialize in pollution problems? I think most toxicologists are feel that, but the, the public opinion isn't influenced by toxicologists particularly. I think most, for the last 10 years, newspaper articles have been having stories about toxic chemical here and toxic chemical there and pollution and carcinogen in your water. And most of the information tends to come from environmental organizations that are, have a very, what I would view as extreme view on everything. And I don't think they're getting the, the general feeling of the scientific community on this. And also the science is changing. People have the idea that carcinogens are rare they're mostly man-made, and we can get rid of them. 
And it, that's not true because 99.99% of the chemicals in the world are natural. And natural chemicals, are, if you test, if you ask our, what percentage of man-made chemicals are coming out as carcinogen, what percentage of natural chemicals, it's about half for either one. That is, half the chemicals they've ever tested have come out as carcinogens among the natural group and about half for the man-made chemicals. I think most of the carcinogen in the world are going to be natural. And the natural substances were much closer to this toxic level than we are for the man-made things. And so we're just not getting enough pollution in to make a difference when you compare it to the whole. Because every meal you eat is full of carcinogens. One should be optimistic that life expectancy is getting longer and we're the healthiest we've ever been in human history. And why the one thing you can be sure of is that life expectancy is going to get longer and longer and that modern technology is enabling us to be healthier and healthier and will continue to do that. The hazardous chemicals that people seem to fear the most are radioactive ones. This fear, says nuclear scientist and radiation expert Bernard Cohen of the University of Pittsburgh, is severely handicapping one of the most promising solutions to air and water pollution, as well as to possible global warming. Is that nuclear power may eventually cause uh, the deaths of perhaps 10 people a year in the United States. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the principal alternative to nuclear power would be burning coal. And if you produce the same amount of electricity by burning coal, you would be uh, killing tens of thousands of people per year in the United States. Uh, the, I think the best uh, study is one done by a Harvard University group. Uh, they did a uh, reanalysis of all the data. There are uh, well over a hundred different studies have been reported on the health effects of air pollution from coal burning. Their estimate is that something like a hundred thousand people a year in the United States die from air pollution and uh, perhaps uh, 30 percent of this is due to coal burning power plants, which would be 30,000 deaths a year. But I mean, the numbers aren't that important. Suppose it was 10,000, even 5,000. With nuclear power, we're talking about numbers like 10, not 10,000 deaths a year. But what about the problem of radioactive wastes? Radioactive waste is the least problem from a technical standpoint. Uh, what you do is you convert it into a rock and put it underground where the rocks are. Uh, now, we know all about how rocks behave, and if you apply our knowledge of rocks to this uh, radioactive waste converted into a rock, it turns out that the health effects of radioactive waste are very, very minimal. In fact, uh, there are three types of buried waste from uh, coal burning power plants that are a thousand times more harmful than the radioactive waste from nuclear power. Uh, for example, a coal burning uh, releases lots of uh, cancer-causing chemicals like uh, beryllium, cadmium, arsenic, things like that, uh, which go into the ground and that eventually gets into food supplies and people eat them. And when you figure out the health effects of these materials, uh, it turns out to be a thousand times worse than the health effects of the radioactive waste. In both cases, it's the same analysis. You put materials in the ground and these materials might get back into food. You do the calculation the same way. Another one of these wastes from coal burning is actually radioactive waste. Uh, coal contains a fair amount of uranium and thorium and radium. And these things are then released into the ground when you burn the coal. Uh, and then uh, people build houses on the ground eventually and then uh, these materials turn into radon. So this extra radon, which will be coming into people's houses then, again, will kill thousands of times as many people as the radioactive waste from nuclear power. Well, now, very recently, there has been new interest in nuclear power as one way to answer the greenhouse effect and acid rain. Do you think this is likely to change things in this country? Well, there's certainly hope that it might. I mean, uh, certainly the environmental groups, which are, who are very influential in uh, convincing the media what to publicize uh, and which does most of the direction of what the government does. Uh, the environmental groups now seem to be more concerned about the dangers of greenhouse effect and acid rain and air pollution also, for finally they're waking up to, uh, than they are about the dangers of nuclear power. This is a very hopeful sign. I mean, nuclear power, of course, completely avoids greenhouse effect, uh, completely avoids acid rain. 
and completely avoids air pollution. The fourth major issue in science and society today is biotechnology, especially stem cell research and genetic engineering. How far can we go and how far should we go in manipulating basic life codes of plants, animals, and human beings? Here we ask Dr. Richard Burgess, former director of the Biotechnology Institute at the University of Wisconsin, to tell us just what is biotechnology. Biotechnology is a, is a general term that's been given to, has many definitions, but I think the most understandable and, and straightforward one is it's applied biology. It's using the knowledge that's been gained by basic research in biology to for practical purposes, for uh, producing new products, producing new processes. And of course, that means it's not new. It's been, um, people have been domesticating animals, domesticating plants, breeding plants for improved food production for thousands of years. They've been making wine and cheese and beer by fermenting and using microorganisms to convert in food processing for thousands of years. Uh, what's new is the, the power that's been uh, developed through research breakthroughs in the last 10, 20 years, particularly in the area of molecular genetics. Um, but not only molecular genetics, also cell biology. Well, recent advances in just the last few years in cloning animals, in genetically altering plants and animals, and in using what are called stem cells taken from discarded human embryos to research and develop radically new ways to cure diseases and repair damaged tissues have made biotechnology even more powerful and more controversial. Opponents like environmentalist Jeremy Rifkin have proposed a moratorium on some kinds of genetic engineering research. I've been on record for years saying we need a moratorium. Uh, we should not be releasing any genetically engineered organisms into the ecosystems of the planet at this time simply because we have no risk assessment science. In the area of petrochemical technologies, uh, we have tests that can be done. There is a science of toxicology. There is no such science when we come to genetic engineering. We have no predictive ecology that can measure the relative risks in placing a microbe or a plant or an animal into a complex ecosystem. And so if we don't have the risk assessment science, it seems to me foolish to maintain the fiction that we can regulate uh, the environmental questions here. His position is, is, is a position. I mean, I respect his, his opinion on this. Uh, I don't agree with it. I think, first of all, that there is a substantial body of risk assessment science, and that's how one determines whether a chemical is likely to be a carcinogen. A new potato that is produced is tested for its safety, whether it's produced by conventional plant breeding or whether it's produced by genetic engineering. Um, there was a, a the, the National uh, Academy of Science can, has convened several major committees to look into this and their conclusion, um, put simply, is that there is no more danger associated with a pro uh, an organism produced genetic engineering than there is by one produced by normal uh, genetics, that in, uh, the more conventional means. There is a tremendous diversity of life and, and new organisms are being, and, and variations on organisms are being created all the time. And they have been since the beginning of, of life. Um, many of these are problems. Many of them are problems where they arise and many of them are problems when they're moved into another environment. Um, that's a concern. But it's no more of a concern what about the, the organisms that are brought in on people's, in the dirt and on the shoes of people who come in from other countries? Uh, do we want to put a moratorium on travel because you might introduce a, a, a harmful organism? I mean, it's, I really consider it to be in the same category as putting a moratorium on travel. When we test uh, an engineered organism that's been engineered to, say, help fix nitrogen to produce natural fertilizer for, for alfalfa and soybeans, we know what we're working with. 
and it's been tested in the laboratory first. It goes through an extensive review, and in fact, these things are much more carefully controlled and understood than than what one brings in on a on a on a on an orange when you bring it in from from the uh, foreign country that you've been traveling on. Every single thing you can think of has associated with it risks and benefits. We ride in cars, which are extremely dangerous uh, activities, because it's convenient. There's some risk and there's some benefit. The same thing is true with genetically engineered organisms. It is worth noting that in 2006, critic Jeremy Rifkin softened his stance somewhat on genetic engineering of plants. He now says that some forms of genetically altered crops may be desirable and environmentally safe. While he still opposes moving genes from one species of plant to another, he now endorses marker-assisted selection, that is, speeding up natural plant breeding by tampering with the genes of particular species, like corn, rice, cotton, or soybeans. Of all the advances in genetic engineering to date, the most startling was the successful cloning of sheep by scientists in Scotland in 1996. Since then, thousands of other animals, sheep, pigs, mice, cows, and others, have been cloned successfully. Someday we may succeed, for instance, in using a combination of genetic engineering and cloning to produce pigs whose organs will be compatible with humans. Then we could clone pig hearts, kidneys, and so forth for transplantation into humans. Dr. Neil First at the University of Wisconsin is one of the leaders in animal cloning. He explains another possible benefit from cloning animal cells, or more likely now, human stem cells. Though there's another kind of transplantation that perhaps isn't so commonly thought about, and it's the transplantation of cells. And the best example of this is, is research with HIV now, where one of the more uh, highly promising therapies on HIV is to engineer the beginning blood cells. We call them stem cells, but they're stem cells for the blood lineage, as different from stem cells of the embryonic lineage. So we have embryonic stem cells that will make any and all cells of an embryo. But these are blood cell lineages. They'll make any and all blood cells. And by starting at that stage and engineering those cells properly, one has the ability to create cells that one will resist the HIV organism so that they'll begin to populate the blood in place of those cells that are susceptible, or two, in some cases, may actually destroy the HIV organism. But those, ex those prospects are very exciting, and that's, that's what people are really referring to when they talk about transplantation, and, and that more than the organ transplant. Our fifth and last question is perhaps the most important and the most controversial of all. Where do we go from here? Wending its way through many of the conflicting strains and views you have now heard is a growing split between people who think we must move in the direction of a no-growth, sustainable society. We must learn how to live more simply in a world of scarcity. This is sometimes called the green movement. On the other side are those who think we need to continue to increase living standards, not only here, but around the world. We must learn to live better and wiser in a world of increasing plenty. The late Eugene Odom, one of the pioneer founders of the science of ecology, explains the no-growth, sustainable direction that he sees for the future. We're individuals. You know, when you teach, the best way to teach is to start with something that, that the, the pupil knows about. Well, everybody has experienced adolescence and how painful that is. Okay, society has the same thing. You see, it goes through adolescence. has a pioneer, rapid growth stage that Mr. Reagan loves uh, and thinks it can go on forever. Uh, and then you have the mature stage like many European countries are in. And so we're in that adolescence. It's called the demographic transition by demo demographers. So we're struggling through and suffering and will suffer from the change from rapid growth to mature, rapid growth low quality to mature high quality, where quality growth continues, but not, not growth, just getting bigger and better. And so this is a message that, that I think that we learn from the holistic ecology, because we learn from nature when we look at the whole, that that's what happens uh, in nature. 
Eugene Odom's brother, Howard Odom, who unfortunately also died recently, goes further and sees an inevitable decline in populations and resource availability and in living standards. So how can we learn to cope with this transition? How can we come down without catastrophe? Well, first we get a task force to lay out the policies that go with leveling and turning down. For example, if you have to cut back, you don't fire people. You cut everybody's salary by that proportion. Now, when you cut people's salary, if it's done across the board, then they are democratically left to choose what it is that they're doing that they could do without. Instead of somebody else firing somebody, you fire somebody, then you've got, you've got welfare problems and you've got crime and you've got um, disruption and, and uh, chaos. And we have to learn to come down and keep try, quit trying to say, well, we must grow, we must grow, because growth has its time and place and that time is over. Since one of the major ways we use energy today is automobiles, I asked Dr. Odom if he drove a car. Yes. I, I believe I'm a successional creature whose job it is to prepare for the climax. Those are the ecological words, right? Successional is the period of, of growth and, and diversification. And my job, as all our jobs are, is to prepare for the next and prepare our youngsters for the next. And so I try to operate, use whatever resources society provides me to get this across. Not excessively, I have a small car, but. I, if there's energy available to make my job more efficient, I use it. And is the reason we have democracy and rights is not for yourself, but to give you the opportunity to contribute more. That y nobody's better suited to decide how they can serve society than the person themselves. And then they can decide, what can I do for society that's really good, that I can really do it, and I can be successful at it, and feel like I'm making a contribution. And that gives you just enormous happiness. And that's, that's what we have to get across. Somehow, people got democracy and rights mixed up with the idea that you're doing it for yourself. For the, uh, That is the purpose. That's a means. Democracy and freedom is a means to your being able to contribute. It's what maximizes power and performance. So the ecosystem, that's what will do it for our society. Well, finally, environmentalist Jeremy Rifkin summarizes the green direction for the future. We need to develop a green lifestyle. We need to change our concepts and relationships to the environment. We have to develop tools that are sustainable to our resource base. We have to realize that the planet is an organism and, not, and that we need to treat it with respect and dignity. And finally, we're going to have to learn that the more we consume, the less resources are available on the earth for other human beings and other creatures. Well, on the other side of the growth, no growth controversy, we have young solar voltaic engineers like Ken Zweibel, who believes that the new solar technologies can be one of the new technologies that lead the way for all the world's people to obtain a higher standard of living that is not only sustainable, but enhanceable. The critical things about the third world is that most of the villages uh, do not have electricity. For instance, I've heard that in India, there are 500,000 villages that are not grid connected. And those are all very uh, fertile field for photovoltaics. And essentially what you would have there is if, if you could have economic photovoltaics, what you would have there is an option that these people could use without the very high costs of connecting to the grid and without adding to pollution. Because one of the great uh, additions to the greenhouse effect is going to come from the third world as they start to electrify those villages and uh, that do not have electricity right now and they're either going to use conventional fossil fuels like coal or they're going to have some option like photovoltaics that doesn't add to the greenhouse effect. We asked Dr. Zweibel what he thought of the view that we must all adjust to a lower standard of living in the 21st century. I think it's a pleasure to uh, participate in the United States high standard of living. I certainly wouldn't want to give up the things that I've become accustomed to and that my two children have also become accustomed to. I don't want photovoltaics or any alternative energy to be looked on as a high cost uh, uh, option that destroys the standard of living that we've become used to. We're attempting to make photovoltaics inexpensive. In fact, we think photovoltaics can drop in cost in the 21st century. 
there are not many t options for making electricity that can make that claim. I'm excited about that, and I'm not excited about reducing our standard of living. And finally, we asked Julian Simon what he thought of teaching children in our schools that because we are so overpopulated, polluted, and running out of natural resources, we must cut back our consumption drastically. Our greatest insurance against bad things is to have more wealth. And when I say wealth, I don't just mean things. I mean knowledge. The reason that we're able to live longer and more safely now than we were a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, is because we know more. We have more tools, and especially the tools of knowledge, to cope with the uncertain things in our environment. People who are well off, countries that are affluent, live much longer and more safely than poor countries. Wealth, true wealth, not just baubles, but true wealth, knowledge especially, is our best insurance against bad things happening. And more wealth, and wealth creates more wealth. Knowledge creates more knowledge, which enables us to live more safely in the future. And those people who would say, stop the world, I want to get off now, they are pointing toward a more dangerous world than the world that says, let's get out there and do great things, because the outcome of that will be the, our greater capacity to deal capably and wisely with our, our world. Human beings made more progress in the 20th century than in all previous centuries on Earth. This progress was led by incredible advances in science and technology and in economic, political, and personal freedom. No one knows how much progress, or its opposite, the 21st century will bring. The experts often disagree. It is you who will have to decide.